called reactive attachment disorder uh, that um, I, I guess I could try and summarize it for you is, is basically, you know, a child is deemed to not have an emotional connection to their parent um, and, uh, and so they misbehave and this is called reactive attachment disorder. It's uh, commonly diagnosed in, in uh, adopted children. And uh, so Federici has a, a proposed treatment for this therapy um, where uh, the, the person administering the treatment, sometimes the parent, sometimes the therapist, restrains the child, uh, pins them down against their will for hours on end, um, and uh, basically, I, I don't know, it seems like, like hugging and whatnot, it's, it's weird. And then, and then, uh, and then after um, all of this is done, after the child's been broken down, uh, they go through this process to try and reform the bond. Um, so Advocates for Children in Therapy uh, is a group of people made up of, um, of uh, nurses and psychologists and uh, actually survivors, uh, I guess this therapy is produced survivor groups, survivors of this type of therapy, that are trying to stop it. And, uh, and so to give you some context, there's a Law and Order uh, episode out there. Um, I don't know if maybe some of you have seen it, but uh, it, it's about a girl that's smothered in a blanket as part of a therapy session and she dies. Uh, and that's based on the case of uh, Candace Newmaker. Um, who was a, a young girl that um, was uh, suffocated and, and killed as a result of this treatment. Um, so uh, Federici legally engages um, advocates for children in therapy for libel and slander uh, because they're trying to stop his practice. So advocates for children in therapy decides they're going to restructure uh, their page um, so that uh, people can draw their own conclusions. They're going to um, essentially make an academic argument uh, and use quotes and whatnot. And uh, this is partly because, um, well, because that's a good idea, and partly because uh, truth is a protection for libel and slander. I'm going to give you an, an example of something that was uh, DMCA'd off of. So this is one of uh, um, Advocates for Children and Therapy's sites. So you can kind of clearly see uh, that there's um, some quoted text over uh, in this area. And then there's a, an academic citation. Um, and it gives the page number, the publisher, uh, everything that we were taught to do in school um, and, uh, and everything that copyright law clearly tells us is fair use. Uh, so, uh, enter the DMCA. Federici finds out uh, about DMCA takedown notices and he files a uh, notice against advocates for children in therapy who are currently hosted or were hosted with this Ma and Pa uh, hosting shop. Uh, so advocates for children in therapy are kicked off of this ma and pa hosting shop um, without the ability to even file a counter notice. Um, so they wind up moving to a large provider that will stand up for them and they go to network solutions. Well, uh, Federici files a counter notice to, I mean, a, a takedown notice to network solutions and again they're kicked off without the ability uh, to file a counter notice. Uh, and the significance of this uh, time is that I guess the legal department at um, network solutions got involved and decided no, they, they shouldn't, I remember this is this is this content, right? They shouldn't have the ability to file a counter notice for this content. Uh, and so, um, so Federici gets the content taken down uh, and they move to Project DOD. And here's a legal procedure, and this is where it's taken, um, it's, it's really been over a year that we've been trying to keep this content online, and it's really just, this is medical critique. Um, and uh, it's not just our clients on Project DOD with ACT that are experiencing this, but um, leading magazines that, uh, if they have uh, bloggers from the magazine who are discussing um, attachment therapy, and with Federici's, Dr. Federici's name associated with it, he gives them the takedown notices too. And they have a big legal department, so they, they fight it. But if you didn't have those type of legal, legal resources, um, going through this procedure on your own would be just uh, very difficult. And um, uh, well, here we go. <laughs> so takedown notice is filed. The entire site comes down. So there's no critique any anymore. Um, Act stuff is down. We allow for a counter notice. Take it down for 10 days. Content comes back up. I, the upstream provider gets harassed, and that's when we call the EFF for some assistance. And they were fantastic. Um, EFF has been very helpful to us. Uh, assist, uh, they're not um, co-counsel, but they are, have been advising us on this case. So uh, Federici has some other doctors send more takedown notices. And for the exact same stuff, for the exact same pages, this is not what the DMCA was intended for. Um, yeah, and I just want to point out, too, that our, our major contribution at this point to censorship resistance is simply that uh, we followed uh, provision number two here, which is uh, we allowed for the user to file a counter notice. Uh, in our experience at this point, uh, the vast majority of internet service providers aren't even allowing this uh, to take place. Uh, I'll give the exception to Google, they tend to do better uh, with this, but most of the other internet service providers, as we'll show later, um, have problems with this. 
So six months goes by. We're like, okay, great. Okay, maybe this is fine now. We're all right. And then Fitter, uh, Dr. Federici has an attorney in Virginia file a takedown notice for the ex same content again. So here we go again. Uh, so we now decide to use, that's it. We're going to fight this. We're going to waive the safe harbor provision. We're going 5112F, which means that um, if we win this uh, attorney's fees, I'm pro bono. Actually, all the attorneys on this have been pro bono. But if we win this, we get attorney's fees covered too. But it pretty much says that if you file takedown notices that you know are, are fraudulent, uh, um, you can you can be held uh, you can help be held liable for that. So the arguments are made in main court, and we, we it, they dismissed for lack of personal jurisdiction. It actually was a little procedural, uh, kind of like a, a thing in the case that we are working on. But we are um, going to appeal in Virginia. That's coming up. Uh, so Federici files another DMC takedown notice, third time, same content, and we're now going to Virginia to pursue this. So common abuses for this. Fair use is not a magic bullet. Um, it's a shame because under copyright law, one of the things that was really important, if you are going to be uh, getting uh, protection for your copyrighted material, you must allow for fair use. It's part of the trade-off. Uh, just like for patents, you must make a disclosure of the secret thing that makes your thing special. But if you don't have fair use, uh, there's some copyright that, material that you're not going to be able to access. So the statutory waiting period is equivalent to a denial of service attack now. I mean, that's similar to the... Uh, um, one of the hypos that we used, if you, uh, as we've seen from the Google statistics as well, that we showed in an earlier slide, this is being used for corporate advantages, um, it, for, and this is not a legitimate use of the DMCA. So the backdoor takedowns, Chris is going to talk a little bit about that as well, and this is an endless chain of attacks. If you didn't have a pro bono attorney, doing this for over a year becomes like a part-time job, and the ISPs aren't willing to take that on. So leveraging a counter notice to discover one's identity is another thing we've noticed that has been really unfortunate, is that um, I, this is something that, uh, as an attorney, I, uh, this is, we didn't expect this, but any of the pro bono attorneys, shall I say any and all, that have assisted with this case, we've experienced some pretty like serious um, uh, online libel. Um, and we can pretty much tell uh, whoever is doing it has been pretty sloppy with the IP address. Again, we're, we're also hackers as well. We, uh, of course, all legal, but we've, we've traced IP addresses and it looks like um, this is related to this case. So all of the attorneys have had some problems with libel who uh, associate themselves with this case. And that's unfortunate. But um, when we file a counter notice, we sometimes there's some women who are trying to hide their identities because it seems like a lot of the libel is mostly toward the female attorneys on the case and the female plaintiffs. So we're there's a woman who would like to challenge this, but she's afraid of the type of libel that we've all experienced. And uh, so uh, having to uh, reveal her identity has been something difficult. And in fact, she decided not to join because of that. Because for the, the counter notice, it's, it's something that we, we need to put on there. Um, and the ISP's liability. This is uh, difficult. Not all ISPs will do what Chris has done. So he's done you know, a really great job standing up for this. And it's, it's what Project DoD is all about. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, just that, that linking a, a disinterested third party that cares about profit to whether or not content stays up is just a bad idea. Uh, we have Lentz versus Universal coming up. This is a case that EFF is working on in California. And if this case, I believe, is still in the appeals process, it's not t complete yet. Um, but if it, when it, we're hoping the resolution for that will be that you must consider fair use when you file the takedown notice. The complicated part of that, though, is to determine if it's fair use, you're most likely still going to have to go to court. Your ISP is not going to really, I, I shouldn't say is not, but most likely not going to stand up for you and, and analyze this stuff. Fair use is getting hard to determine as well. Um, when you talk about, like, for music with uh, sampling, and uh, it's, it, it becomes a, a legal argument. Did you take the heart of the copyrighted material? But in our case, we found it was a lot easier. You should be able to say a couple sentences from a book that someone has published or from uh, one of their public presentations. They said this. If it's properly attributed, that's fair use if you use it. And for critique purposes, it's even a stronger protection. So um, it's hard to use fair use as a, as a defense against the DMCA, which is a shame because uh, it's not what it's, uh, the DMCA was supposed to do, I believe. But in our experience, uh, 5112F is hard to use, and we have some jurisdictional issues with 5112F as well. I, I know, which I think the jurisdictional issues are going to get interesting if there's, uh, the ACTA is passed, because then you're talking about takedown notices being filed from people in other countries. Where are you going to wind up resolving those cases? And 
we've had that problem already. We're getting some stuff from Australia. As you know, you've perhaps uh, been reading that Australia is becoming, the censorship there for material is becoming really challenging. So we're getting some takedown notices from Australia. We're thinking, wow, we're, that's going to be really complicated, you know, considering international law, how and if we're going to respond to that. Um, another thing, uh, too, that I just, you know, when you guys leave the talk and, and you're looking at news articles online is that uh, when you see a lot of the, I'm, you know, I think it's great that, that there are some wins happening against the DMCA at this point, but a lot of them are related to fair use. Uh, and just like Lens versus Universal was, um, but fair use is really something that, that you need to fight in court. Uh, it doesn't stop this sort of pre-court, you know, uh, guilty until proven innocent uh, attack on people. And so um, it's great if you want to defend yourself in court, uh, but the real trick, um, and trust me on this, is to stay out of court, period. Uh, it's time consuming, it's expensive, uh, it takes forever, so um, so we need something that, that helps people stay out and, and not be uh, legally engaged. Uh, so I want to give some uh, examples that we've come across of uh, fair use abuse. Um, in 2005, uh, we hosted two domains, walmart-foundation.org and the 700club.org. Uh, we hosted them for about two weeks. Um, they were, uh, the two people that made the sites were part of a subversive media class at Carnegie Mellon University. And they had made the sites as a sort of social commentary on these uh, two nonprofit organizations. Uh, and um, there was, you know, there was a good satire, the articles were funny, um, but it had the same sort of look and feel, the same way you'd see like on The Daily Show or Colbert Report. Um, Anyway, Walmart and the 700 Club filed DMCA takedown notices uh, for this content. And of course, you know, to maintain our safe harbor, uh, we, we said, okay, well, the content has to come down, but you guys can file a counter notice. And, and these two users, um, they're students, they're art students. And uh, they really struggled with the idea of trying to, to file this because, of course, it's fair use that they have to defend. And if uh, Walmart or the 700 Club wanted to take them to court, uh, they'd be up against, you know, the legal might of, of those organizations. Um, so, uh, so fair use is, is tricky. Uh, it's tricky to use um, to defend this stuff. So the content went offline um, and uh, never came back up. Uh, and so then the other one, of course, uh, is Project DoD versus Federici. Uh, and by the way, the reason we covered Project DoD versus Federici in the beginning of the case is not only because it's interesting and, and we can talk about it and I think people will find it interesting, but uh, uh, Federici happens to hit every single abuse case that we're going to talk about. Like, he's really skilled at looking at, at this and finding, I mean, you know, think of him, he's like a security researcher, but, uh, but for law. <laughs> so he finds all these flaws and, and winds up uh, abusing them. But um, uh, just further proof that fair use is hard to use, um, uh, he started and engaged us after the Lens versus Universal finding, uh, which said that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, um, it's a misrepresentation, or I should say that um, uh, it's a necessary precondition to the elements of notification that one must consider fair use. And so that didn't stop him. This is what we're talking about with the, uh, at, we're making the analogy to a, a denial of service attack. The 10 day period for taking the uh, content down is a long time. And when you're talking about O days, or you're talking about you know competitive advantage in the marketplace, 10 days is a long time if parts of your site, and at times we've had to take down significant parts of people's sites to meet the statutorily required 10-day uh, uh, period. Oh, and I wanted to note that we were mentioning counter notices. If you receive a DMCA takedown notice and you don't want to go right out and hire an attorney to defend you, I would um, check out chillingeffects.org. Um, when I was in law school, uh, Chilling Effects was just coming up. Uh, Wendy uh, Sel Seltzer, I think from, uh, she was with uh, Berkman Center at Harvard Law School, and she was later with the FF, and I think she's a law professor now, but she was uh, one of the founders of Chilling Effects. And Chilling Effects addresses uh, cases like these, and they address copyright, patents, trademarks, but if uh, they, Wendy created a form that all you have to do is put in a, you know, some information and it will auto-generate a counter notice for you. So it'll save you, if, if you do choose to, to do this without advising an attorney, um, although we recommend that you might want to do that first, but if you decide to do it, go to chillingeffects.org and you can get your counter notice uh, right there. Uh, right, so here's some examples of uh, abuse, basically the, the Federici case again. Uh, he, he figures out that when um, he files these takedown notices, the content goes down and then a counter notice is, is filed, but the content can't come back up for 10 days because we're statu statutorily required to keep it down. 
in order to maintain the safe harbor. So what he does is he contacts six of his colleagues and he has them file uh, DMCA takedown notices for different portions of the, um, of the Advocates for Children and Therapy site. And uh, as a result, the, the site or